One of my favorite techniques in photography is shooting panoramas with a telephoto lens. In today's episode, we are going to go through the entire process of how to set up your gear, what you can, what you can't do in the field, the capture technique, uh, composition, camera settings, and the overall post-processing workflow I used in Lightroom. Hi everyone, what's going on? During my recent uh, winter workshop in Iceland, uh, the group and I spent uh, an entire morning shooting the insanely beautiful Vestrahorn, an incredible mountain in the Stosknes Peninsula in the southeast of the island. I already photographed this location many times, and unfortunately, this winter we didn't find much snow in the area. Anyway, for this session, I wanted to photograph it from a, a different perspective uh, rather than uh, from down to the beach uh, or using the dunes uh, as foreground. I decided to create uh, a big panorama image, uh, combining multiple images using my Fujifilm 50 to 140. As a reference, during the trip, I shot almost 80% uh, of my images with a telephoto. Just to give you a rough idea of how important a telephoto lens is uh, if you plan to visit Iceland for the first time or it's just maybe my telephoto addiction or whatever. Anyway, let's get started. So your first question might be, why not use a wide angle lens to frame uh, the entire scene in one single shot? Well, with a wide angle lens, we have definitely a wider angle of view. However, a wide angle lens tends to exaggerate the distance between you and the object. And that's absolutely great if you have a strong foreground that leads you to the background. But for this specific composition, the point of interest is very far away. I would also say that the primary reason to capture a composite panorama rather than a single wide-angle photo would be to produce an image of a higher resolution. So composition-wise, from that position, it would have been impossible to fill the frame with the mountains and have a great balance with the scene. And here is where the telephoto comes into play. It has different advantages over the wide-angle. The telephoto has a narrower angle of view uh, we can get closer to the subject and concentrate our attention much more on it. But there is a caveat. The limitation is that we can't get the entire scene in one single frame. And that's basically why we need to shoot uh, multiple images and stitch them together to have a, a full real estate representation of the location. I already emphasized it many times in some of my previous videos. Uh, another great benefit of using the telephoto is that uh, you can easily switch from horizontal to vertical compositions uh, taking advantage of the lens color. That's very handy when you need to decide how to frame and execute the panorama. And another advantage is the telephoto has much less distortion, especially towards the edges. And you don't have the parallax effect that you get with the wide angle lens. So it's much easier to stitch multiple images together in Lightroom. Okay, let's start about the basics and the shooting steps for the correct execution. Let's start with the gear, the tripod and the camera. I recommend using a sturdy tripod and leveling it to keep your series of images level. Uh, to level the tripod, you can use the built-in bubble level, if your tripod has one, and adjust the legs so the level's bubble is centered. Of course, uh, you need to have a, a tripod head with the panel control to pan. That isn't to say nice panoramas can't be done handheld. I shoot many handheld panoramas getting wonderful results, but the images shoot that way sometimes might be harder to stitch together, although stitching software is getting better and better. Then you also need to level the camera side to side, and I usually use the in-camera electronic level. Very handy function. To enable it on the Fujifilm X-T4, you have to go to the main menu, setup, screen setup, and display custom settings uh, and select uh, the electronic level checkbox. If you don't level the tripod and camera, the series of images will surely slope uh, downward uh, on one side or on the other. Your goal is to make uh, your images as level as possible across the entire series to optimize uh, the details collected. Let's take a look at uh, other important settings uh, and aspects we need to take care of. The main thing when shooting uh, a panel is to lock down all the camera settings so the camera won't be making any adjustments on its own. So what does it mean? Here are my 10 recommended steps. Number one, never use the auto white balance for images intended for a panorama. You don't want the camera to change the white balance between images and it will happen if the scene colors radically change from one side to the other. Of course, shooting in RAW, you can correct it later on in Lightroom, but I always prefer to get a consistent result throughout the entire sequence right in camera. So always use a preset white balance or if you like, use the K option to enter a specific color temperature choice. As my personal preference, I always set up the white balance to daylight and forget it. Number two, it's very important that the camera doesn't change focus between the shots of a panorama series. 
My recommendation is to use the manual focus and keep uh, your paws off the lenses focusing ring. In this case, uh, I manually focused on the mountain using the peak focusing highlights function, making sure to have uh, the entire scene in focus front to back. You can use the autofocus mode just to focus one time and then put it back uh, into manual and continue shooting the rest of the exposure. Number three, don't change uh, the focal length between the images of a single panorama. Changing zoom settings uh, would cause the same object in adjacent images to be different sizes and the stitching software would be unable to properly align the images. I selected a focal length of 50 mm uh, which is a 75 mm full frame equivalent. So be careful with the longer lenses such as uh, for example 300 mm. The magnification of longer focal length causes limited depth of field which can cause noticeable changes uh, to foreground focus between the images of a series. Number four, always use uh, the same setting for all uh, the images uh, shoot for the panoramas. For this shot, I selected ISO 160, the lowest native Fuji ISO to get the cleanest image quality. If you find yourself shooting in windy conditions, uh, you might have some camera shake. So I highly recommend choosing an ISO value that guarantees you the proper shutter speed to avoid any blurred image. Take care that uh, just one blur image in the sequence uh, and it will completely screw up the final panel image. Number five, use a manual exposure so that the exposure remains the same for all the images of a single panorama. Any changes to either aperture or shadow speed between the images would make it difficult to match uh, when the images are stitched together. For the shots, I used a uh, shadow speed of uh, 1 of 40th of second uh, that was a uh, just enough to get pin sharp uh, shots uh, since there was uh, just a gentle breeze coming from the seam. I always use uh, the cable release to avoid shaking the camera. As an alternative, you can use the two second timer if you will. In terms of aperture, I selected the diaphragm F8, which was uh, perfect to guarantee a great depth of field from to back and uh, an excellent image quality performance of the lens. Notoriously, the telephoto lens have a lower depth of field than uh, wide angle lenses. So at a given aperture, the sharpness is not going to be as wide uh, throughout the frame with the telephoto as it would be with a wide angle. However, in landscape photography using uh, the telephoto, you are not going to uh, have a noticeable foreground. Everything uh, you're shooting is going to be far away. So that issue is no longer an issue. And an aperture between F8 and F16 usually provides excellent sharpness throughout. Number six, as just mentioned, to expose the scene, always use manual exposure and your histogram. First, point the camera at the brightest area to be included in the panoramic image and adjust the shutter speed so the important highlights are well exposed. This means that the right side of the histogram data approaches as closely as possible but doesn't actually touch the right edge of the graph. Use that exposure for the entire series and take care that the prevailing light doesn't change during the series. Number seven, I tend to always switch off any image stabilization features on the lens or within the camera body. The image stabilization can actually introduce a, a camera shake if left on when the camera is mounted on a tripod. And especially when using a telephoto lens, those movements will be exaggerated and result in a softer image. Number eight, in terms of orientation, for this specific scene, I chose the vertical orientation that enabled me to include all the information I needed. The entire panorama consists of two rows, one to include more of the sea and another one to bring in more sky. Shooting vertical images capture more space above and below the subject, uh, so there is less chance uh, of uh, accidentally cropping uh, part of the scene. Number nine, for some reason, I captured the sequence I started from the right side, so from where I meter the exposure. But I suggest making your first shot uh, on the left side of the scene, uh, which simplifies lining up uh, your images properly in the film strip in Lightroom. It doesn't make any difference in uh, the final result, it's just to keep things uh, in order. And the last one, number 10, as you shoot uh, the series of images as a general rule of thumb, make sure each uh, image overlap the previous one by about 30% or more. The software requires uh, having uh, identical objects in addition to images uh, to line them up uh, precisely. So as you are moving around, you're gonna make sure that uh, you only move about uh, 
two thirds uh, through the next shot before you take another image. This rule is really just for mid-range lenses, uh, something like uh, 35, uh, 50 millimeters or above, like in this case. Before taking a look at how I edited this photo, I want to make a big thank you to Barrett, who very kindly sent me a couple of pairs of date gloves for my Iceland workshop. At the moment, I've been using the Markov Pro version 3 model and the Power Stretch Pro liner with touch uh, as an additional base layer that provides even more warmth in freezing conditions. They are specifically made for professional photographers, great build quality, lovely design. They have got what they call the flip tech finger caps with magnets on them. So when you open the fingertips, you can fold them back and the magnets allow them to stay in place. They are absolutely perfect for my big hands. I found the finger caps really convenient when I need to use the camera touch screen, my phone, uh, or the drone remote controller. They are very versatile and they use uh, excellent materials that don't make them feel big and bulky when wearing them. So, highly recommend the photography gloves. Uh, I leave the link uh, in the video description if you're interested in knowing more about their model line. All right, so here we are in Lightroom and here we have got uh, the entire sequence of images, two rows uh, for a total of uh, 30 images. Stitching software-wise, I generally use Lightroom and its panorama photo merge function because uh, this method preserves the raw file data and provides you with the full control over the tones. Lens distortion and vignette correction and chromatic aberration are automatically applied to the images behind the scenes before stitching. For Fujifilm users, the raw files have built-in lens correction, so no problem at all. To stitch images together, the process is pretty straightforward. We're gonna select all the images, except for the two black frames to bookmark the start and at the end of the sequence. Then right click on the film strip flyout menu and select photo merge and then panorama. This will open the panorama merge preview dialog box uh, where you can select from three projections methods. I used the cylindrical option which produces a better result for this specific merger. The spherical mode tends to squeeze the mountain a little bit. I prefer the slightly stretched verticals that make uh, the mountain more slender. As you can notice, here on the bottom right, uh, we have some missing information. And the problem is that uh, with these kinds of photos, there is sometimes very little information that can be used uh, to perfectly merge and align the images. Actually, for us, uh, these are photos uh, of the sea and sky. So for us, it, this is pretty easy. But for Lightroom, these are just a bunch of pixels with no clearly matching patterns. That means you may have to stack them into layers uh, and line the layers manually in Photoshop. As always, I like to keep things simple. It's an easy problem to fix just using the crop tool to get rid of that area once the sequence merges in a single DNG file. This is probably the main reason why you want to overshoot in the field, giving yourself ample room for mistakes and you are simply going to crop the exceeding areas in post. Okay, the panel preview looks pretty good. Since we shot on a level tripod, the alignment is great, so the white empty areas on the edges are very small. You can adjust the boundary warp slider to make the boundary of the panorama fit more closely to the edges of the frame, but because of the missing frame, we can't use it. Otherwise, we would have a weird warping and a badly distorted result. However, we have other two options. The first is fill edges, which uses the content aware algorithm to fill the white edges. And here I have to say it works pretty well. Or the auto crop function that automatically crops out uh, the uneven areas. But as you can see, the result is totally wrong to me, so I generally prefer to crop the panel manually using the Lightroom's crop tool. Now, we're gonna hit uh, merge to create the panorama DNG file, which will be added to the film strip and named by adding a panel suffix. Great, here is our stitch panel shot. The resulting image is a huge 256 megapixel resolution monster with a DNG file size of 822 megabytes. So it's a massive amount of information. Now, what I wanna do is to show you all the adjustments I applied to the image. I turned off all the global and local adjustments so we just can start from scratch. First off, I cropped the image to balance the overall composition and applied some basic adjustments on the basic panel like the white balance to increase the warmth and a few tweaks to the contrast and a highlight slider to recover some information in the clouds. Then I increased the saturation on the mountain and the sky, just adjusting the RGB channels in the calibration panel. I quite like to introduce more saturation working with these sliders rather than using the 
global saturation slider in the basic panel. I also changed the hue in the blue channel towards the aqua tone. And now I can already see more color separation between the blue sky and the clouds. As a next step, I applied a custom tonal curve to increase the global contrast and a tiny small adjustment to the blue channel curve to add more blue in the shadows. About using curve, I have an in-depth video here on the channel on how to use curve tool. I leave the link in the video description below. Okay, in the HSL panel, very small tweaks to reduce the saturation of the blue that was too strong for my liking. I very much prefer soft, desaturated tones and also a tiny small tweak to the red hue. I'm not a huge fan of yellowish tones. Moreover, this minus 10 value on the blue luminance helps quite a lot to increase the contrast in the clouds. As always, small adjustments make a big difference in post-processing. I'm gonna leave the color grading panel alone for a moment and let's have a look at the local adjustments uh, so the juicy part of the editing process where the magic happens. The first layer is to add a sort of fake haze. I basically want to emphasize the natural spray created by the waves. These are the settings I used, uh, negative dehaze, uh, I reduced the highlights to avoid any clipping, uh, increased the contrast uh, and added some warmth. The next layer is about increasing the contrast in the mountain, which uh, on the original RAW it doesn't have enough dimension. Here below are the settings I used. This is the before and after, before and after. Next adjustment layer, which I called seawater, where I gently brush some areas of the water to increase the whites, giving the sea slightly more depth and contrast. This is the before and this is the after. Before and after. This next one is to make these white lines in the seashore pop. I restricted the area using the luminance range mask and increased the exposure, highlights uh, and whites. Another layer to darken the sky, making it more uh, dramatic. I selected the sky simply using the very convenient uh, select sky function and just decreased the exposure. I also added a graduated filter here on the top left to reduce uh, the brightness on the corner. It helps to focus the viewer's eye more on the mountain. With a light painting layer, as you can see, using a radial filter, I introduce a sort of fake light that makes uh, the light coming from the sun on the right more dynamic. I also filter out uh, the shadows intersecting a luminance range mask. Here a simple radial filter on the bottom left to increase the exposure. The next layer is about making the blue color in the sky more even, increasing the blacks level. This is the before, after, before and after. To my liking, the saturation on the left side of the mountain is a bit strong and distracting. So I selected just this portion and I reduced the, the saturation by just three points. The before and after. The second to last adjustment is to increase the highlights on the right peak, which now looks much, much better, more dynamic. In this case, it's really important to restrict the tones using the color range mask. This is before, this is the after, before and after. With the last layer, I just added a basic radial filter to recover the highlights in this uh, tiny bright peak uh, with the snow. And as a final step, let's activate the color grading panel where I applied a blue tone uh, on the shadows, a tiny bit of yellow on the highlights, uh, and I shifted the global tone towards the blue. It's very, very subtle, but I like it. And here it is. Let me show you the before and after, before, and after. For the sake of the tutorial, I will leave the fellow photographers there, but they are easily removable in Photoshop as I'm going to show you in the next image. This is the final product and uh, the image is now ready to be exported. 
Recently, I published a video specifically about uh, my favorite method to sharpen and export images for the web. And I think you might find it really useful. I'm gonna put that for you to watch it here next. Okay, I hope you found this video useful and now I would love to know how you take panoramas. If you have any questions, please drop me a comment down below. If you haven't already, give the video a thumbs up. It helps me out a lot and subscribe to the channel for more. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Ciao.